there are the concerns of wealthy countries that have highly developed airport and airline systems. And that has very much to do with ease of movement and daylight and mobility and uh, visitor experience. And then there's the opposite end of that, uh, which are poorer countries that are much less developed in the role of airlines. Uh, Jonathan, of course, really focused us on Africa, which was a really fascinating discussion. And Ashok began with a map that showed how developed, at the present moment, uh, North America, Europe, Asia are, and yet Africa and South America are much less developed. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about the intersection between those two worlds and the kind of lessons learned. Uh, can there be lessons from the one poorer countries learned by the wealthier countries? And probably more interesting, can there be a reverse discussion? So first of all, if anybody would like to question or ask the question, answer the question, given those differences, how can you build flexibility for the future when those futures seem quite different? Uh, the obvious point to start with is that uh, if you have nothing uh, or very little, there's nothing to disrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't know so much about the aviation industry, but just in the last couple of years, working on the drone port uh, concept. It's been very interesting going to these sort of meta aviation companies, the ones that mm -hmm. run security or insurance or, uh, you know, um, uh, gangways and, mm -hmm. and all hydraulic systems. And, and you, you realize that these guys are really quite aggressive uh, at fulfilling their business plan for the next 20, 30 years. So their idea of what the fu future of an airport should be mm -hmm. will always include their particular technology. Right, right. Uh, when you're very poor, you can actually rethink the whole uh, idea of what is required, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think that's one, one simple point, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about anybody else? Yes, I, actually, we, we're doing an airport in Uganda. Uh -huh. And uh, I think the lessons learned from a rich country like Norway, where you can actually explore all the options to make uh, the airport really efficient and work properly, is to scale back and take that uh, knowledge and information and go down to the basics. So, for example, the handling luggage will be people working in there, uh -huh. using their own bodies to, to move the uh, mm -hmm. cargo around. So we, we use that as a base for what we're doing. So that means mm -hmm. that knowing airports like we do can be a very, uh, um, can be a very uh, interesting knowledge to bring to the basics, mm -hmm. because we know what is important for that, uh, that airport to function. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we can get rid of everything else that is connected to Europe and to the de developed countries. Uh -huh. Interesting. OK. I should, yeah. Yeah, if, I, if I could just add to that. Are you hearing me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, is that there's also this uh, uh, sort of tension uh, in, in the developing countries uh, between the cost of technology, mm -hmm. which clearly is uh, uh, something that, uh, as, as you heard earlier, is, is going to be uh, front and center of, uh, of advancement. Uh, so it's the tension between the cost of technology, which is high, uh, and the cost of labor that is low in developing mm -hmm. countries. And uh, uh, I've, I've sort of got this first-hand uh, experience with uh, Mexico City, uh, where we're designing an airport mm -hmm. there. and. Uh, uh, that's exactly that. That discussion just keeps cropping up uh, about uh, uh, technology versus labor. Uh, I think that what happens is what uh, what has happened in in places like India, uh, China to some extent, uh, is that uh, initially uh, the processes will still be uh, somewhat labor intensive, mm -hmm. 
but as uh, the country grows in its, uh, in its economic profile and labor does start to get expensive, then sort of technology takes over. So it's kind of like a two-step process, mm -hmm. but eventually I think the goals uh, of what that airport should be doing or what a particular process in an airport should be doing uh, is not going to be any different from uh, uh, an advanced country versus a developing country. What about uh, drone ports? And are, is there going to be some cross-pollination between the drone port and the traditional airport? Will drones affect the traditional airport and will the traditional airport affect drone ports? I mean, how, do they, how are they going to relate to one another as, technol as new technologies? Um, well, I, I think that um, Emirates or Norway, so I think we were saying last night that I, I can imagine a, a Norway utilizing its existing uh, rural uh, mm. and island uh, airport uh, infrastructure using, uh, using cargo drones uh, and the same in my native Scotland and in parts of America. In, uh, in uh, emerging uh, economies, I, I, I anticipate a completely different um, structure. So I, I, I think that medium towns should be connected to other medium towns. I mean, without getting too much into the macroeconomic uh, history, um, the colonial and post-colonial uh, history in, in, in Africa particularly centralized the economy in one or two cities in the country. Uh -huh. So you actually have quite a few secondary towns which uh, which don't uh, uh, have much of an economic uh, connection with, e with each other, you know? So you can have a town, uh, Nigeria is a really good example. Nigeria will end up with over 250 million people. Many of its towns are not connected to each other. So I think that drone ports will function quite, quite well in, in, in that form of connectivity. Right. You know? There's also been a lot of discussion about the urban airport. As airports uh, you become quieter, as airplanes maybe be able to take off without long runways, uh, can you each talk a little bit about this idea of the urban airport? And does the drone in some way make that more possible? Because it flies, you know, it's less loud, it's whatever. I mean, is there some. Could you talk about the urban airport, this idea of more dense? Just one final quick point for me. I mean, when we, uh, with uh, Norman, when we started to design the drone port, we actually right. had a, a, an airstrip next to it. Uh -huh. And in the last two years that, that we've been working on the project, um, we've realized that it is possible already to get to VTOL uh, uh, drones. Uh -huh. So that completely is going to change the configuration of the drone port, and then you will see something see. more like a Roman uh -huh. courtyard, uh -huh. where that, that similar building, but but it would have it would be landing in the in I the see. courtyard, um, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that at least for drones, I can't speak for planes, but at least for for pretty large drones, they're going to be purely vertical and then right, shoot right. off, yeah. You know. And what are those implications for more traditional airports, air terminals? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not sold on the uh, idea of uh, uh, an urban airport. Uh, I think that uh, on a small scale, perhaps it could happen. Uh, but I think for the mega airports, the you know, 45 to 50 million uh, passenger mm. per year airport, uh, I think you're still going to see them somewhat removed from cities. And that's not really a big issue anymore because if you take Hong Kong, for example, you know, you have the, uh, the high-speed train that gets you from Hong uh -huh. Kong, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, center city Hong Kong uh, to the airport in 17 minutes. So that's not a big deal. It takes me 45 minutes to get from my office in Manhattan to LaGuardia. Right. And one could argue that LaGuardia uh, is an urban airport. Right. So I think right. that there is some application at smaller scales, but at the larger scale, I think the real okay. estate in, in urban areas is just far too valuable. Prohibitive, yeah. Okay, anybody else? We're at? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I really agree with that point that mm -hmm. Ashok just made because we keep talking about planes becoming more efficient and vertical takeoff planes, but these 
and we're also talking about sustainability. Mm -hmm. And those are two things that are going in opposite directions. It's very difficult to do an efficient, an efficient plane that takes off vertically mm -hmm. and then is able to maintain any kind of speed on the horizontal. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like we're dreaming about that, but we don't really have an idea about how we're going to do it yet. All right. Thank you very much.